This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 459, recorded on September 15th, 2017. This episode is brought to you by the Defense Threat Reduction Agency, part of the U.S. Department of Defense. The agency's Chemical and Biological Technologies Department hosts the 2017 Chemical and Biological Defense Science and Technology Conference to exchange information on the latest and most dynamic developments for countering chemical and biological weapons of mass destruction. Find out more at cbdstconference.com. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me here in New York City, Dixon de Pommier. Hello, Vincent. It's a nice day out, isn't it? It is, but you know, if you were around yesterday and you stepped outside, it was hot and humid, and that was an enormous change from it was maybe two or three days ago, and what we're experiencing right now is the remnants of Irma. This is the tropical smell Really? Of a yeah, of a of a, of a fizzled out hurricane. Twenty six Celsius. Yeah. Partly cloudy. And humid. I loved it. I love the humidity. You like humidity. That's incredible. And yet you live in New Jersey. I don't understand. Sometimes it's humid here. <laughs> yeah, but it's nothing like the South. Also joining us from southeastern Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi everybody. Hey Kathy. It's yep. pretty nice here. It's a cloudy day, but it's seventy six Fahrenheit, which is twenty four Celsius. Right. Something wrong with your throat? Yeah, I was going to ask. Yeah. You, sound a little, yeah. you have a cold? Are you in no, recovery? No, I think there's a frog in it. A frog. <laughs> a Kermit. <laughs> Poor Kermit. Yeesh. Also joining us from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi, everybody. Hey, How you doing? How you doing? Is that frog left over from uh, Irma? <laughs> That's right. It's raining frogs. I, yeah, I'm trying to get rid of the frog. Ah. Okay. See. So it's uh, 86 degrees here and sunny. That's 30 uh, Celsius. And it's uh, delightful. Uh, I am, I am um, learning to enjoy the lack of humidity. Ha! Huh. So I did humidity for a long time. Yes, you did. It was, it was okay. Uh, I'm not sorry that it's not here. So there's no humidity in Austin, no? Hot and dry. It is significantly drier. And we, yeah. ha- we have it here because we're on the coast, right? That's correct. I guess. I don't yeah. know. Yeah, if you just went down to Houston, you'd find it all over the place, Rich. I'm sure. Yeah, and that's not far away. That's interesting. No. Kathy, do you want to do this uh, ASM conference again? Sure. Go ahead. So uh, the ASM conference of viral manipulation of nuclear processes will be held December 3rd through 6th, 2017 in Charleston, South Carolina. And the reason we're telling you about it now is because the abstract deadline and travel grant application deadline are Monday, September 25th, coming right up. So this meeting is about how viruses manipulate cellular processes to replicate and focuses on how they perturb nuclear functions. It has a broad scope, including viruses that are nuclear DNA viruses, nuclear RNA viruses, polyoma, papilloma, adeno, retroviruses, herpes viruses, And also, it's got a broad interest, and they'll include RNA viruses that replicate in the cytoplasm but exploit nuclear functions. So once again, the abstract deadline and travel grant application deadline of this ASM meeting is Monday, September 25th. And you can go to tinyurl.com slash asmnucleus to get the information about the meeting. Charleston, there'll be humidity there, right? Also. Oh, yes. Mm. You betcha. And there will be Michael Schmidt and Paula Trachtman. Those are two people I know who are there. Mm-hmm. And really good food. I've never been to Charleston. Really big. Oh, oh. Charleston's great. It is. Mm. Yeah. It is, but it has a checkered past. It's in, in, in what sense? Civil it War was, type stuff? Yeah, prior to that, it was the entry point for slaves yeah. into the United States. It's the only place in the United States where we had um, autochthonous transmission of, of uh, elephantiasis. Oh, no, which area? 
This Which is Witchery at Bancroft. Bancroft. Yeah, that was brought from Africa to the United States. It lasted just for a, a brief spell, but it was there. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. If you've ever dreamed of working at the Smithsonian, now's your chance. The American Society for Microbiology has an immediate opening for a public outreach fellow who will work closely with ASM and the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History to develop public programming supporting an exhibit on viral zoonotic diseases. This is a 12-month paid position with benefits, the perfect stepping stone for someone to looking to break into the world of science outreach. Go to bit.ly slash ASM fellowship to apply. Nice. Are you going to apply, Vincent? <laughs> no, I'm not going to apply. <laughs> I don't want a 12-month position. No. Um, I don't want to work with the Smithsonian. But more importantly, I have a job. That's right. right. I have two jobs, and I really like them both. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. It's so I don't need to do this. I don't need to slip on stones. Oh, no, that's not what they said. Wow. Uh, this is actually something being done by the communications department at ASM, of which I am chair, so I couldn't really apply for this <laughs> if I wanted to. <laughs> but this is going to be an exhibit it's coming up very quickly, May 2018, which is the 100-year anniversary of which infectious disease event? One would have to say yellow fever, but oh, probably not. cholera. 2018, 100 years back would be what? Ooh, flu. 1917. Flu. That's big right. Flu yeah, the big flu epidemic. That's right. The next year, it's, it's 2018. Exactly. Exactly. So May 20, it's part of the... They're saying that we're going to commemorate it, but I don't think commemorate that's is the right That's a zoonosis. That is, most people don't think of it that way, but that's a yeah, zoonosis. Of we talked about the origins not too long yeah. ago. Interesting yeah. confluence of events. All right. Sharon Isern writes, we're safe, minor damage, fallen trees, street flooding, but otherwise in good shape. Remarkably did not lose power. She sent a video of our view of Hurricane Irma's northern eye wall. Mm. And there's a lot it's- of... Wind and rain, right? Yeah, it's really cool. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's up it's, through it, some it's glass cool. it's, ceiling. It's cool if you're looking at the video and you're not there. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know where that is. It, it looks institutional. She, it's probably her work. Uh, right? No, 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 no. <laughs> That's a, she's looking through her screen room. What's a screen room? Oh, the thing over uh, your pool? The thing over your pool. Uh, so you know exactly what that is, huh? Uh, yeah. Huh. Um. The the palm trees are remarkably resilient, so I guess yeah. they've they've evolved that way to, to bend yeah. with the flow, right? This is true. Yeah. So they're the last thing to get ripped out, or do they never get ripped out? They do, of course. Oh, they, they go do. now and then. Sure, they do. Okay. All right, we have a few things to talk about today. First one comes to us via Peter. Good morning. I'm a fan of your show, though I admit I haven't listened in a while. You probably saw the news, and he sends a press release from Penn Medicine about the approval of a therapy by the FDA for advanced leukemia, uh, also a link to an FDA briefing. Have you guys covered this therapy yet? My understanding is that Carl June repurposed the HIV virus to modify a patient's own T-cells to combat their leukemia. Sounds fascinating, and I would love to hear a twiv discussion on the topic. So I had seen this week uh, an article in the Times which kind of um, stimulated this idea to do this briefly. So this is a new drug which involves viral gene therapy uh, to treat um, uh, an advanced form of leukemia in in kids, ALL, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, which can be involve either T or B cells, but uh, most of them are B cells. So you make tons of immature B cells, and they don't work very well. And since B cells are important for making antibodies, that that's a problem. 3,100 cases a year in children and adolescents. Uh, in, in the U.S.? In the U.S., yes. So this is a new drug approved by the FDA, which is really interesting. The first thing you need to know is that B cells have on their surfaces a protein called B19. Very important. CD19. Yeah, it's also B19, right? Okay, okay. <laughs> that was an airplane in the Second World War, Vincent. <laughs> uh, B19, was it, really? <laughs> That's right. Anyway, so this therapy involves removing. So, first of all, there are therapies for this um, cancer, but when they fail, the kids die. Okay. And they often fail. So, they develop this they take out your T cells. So, they pull out plasma and, and remove the T cells from that. And then 
they infect them with a lentivirus that's been engineered to produce a protein that doesn't exist anywhere on the planet, as far as we know, <laughs> called chimeric antigen receptor, or CAR. And this consists of an extra, completely engineered, an extracellular domain, which is a single-chain antibody that recognizes B19. Oh, got it. And that comes, that's cloned out of a hybridoma cell line. And there's a transmembrane domain. And then there's a cytoplasmic domain, which when the, uh, when the antibody on the extracellular part engages B19, it will signal through this intracellular domain and make the cell proliferate and make more of it. So they take T cells, they infect them with a lentivirus to produce this protein in them. Then they put the T cells back in the kid intravenously. And then when they encounter a B cell, basically, they kill it. Right. And this did really well in clinical trials, you know, over 60, 70% cure. And so it was approved. And now we have this as the first gene therapy approved by the FDA. I think you might have misspoken just a little bit. You said when they put the B cells back in. T cells. I think you meant the T cells -cells back in, then they kill the B cells. Yeah, because we pull out T cells, we modify them. So it takes 22 days. This is tricky. And um, you get a lot of so the drug is the actually the virus, right? Because the cells came from from, from the patient, and uh, I think this is pretty cool. And there are lots of modifications in the pipeline um, to this, and uh, it's changed over the years. And th- that's basically it. And um, I think that there's an interesting uh, issue here. The New York Times had an article this week. One treatment costs four hundred seventy five thousand dollars. <laughs> Okay, and they had quotes from industry people. This is being done by Novartis, and they said, "Well, you know, the price should reflect the value to the patient. This is going to save their lives." And I thought, <laughs> you know, vaccines <laughs> save your life, but we don't charge that much. And you, and you know why? Because you can sell millions of doses of of vaccines, and here you can only sell thousands, maybe at most. So they're not being honest. They should say, we want to recover the development costs, and this is what it is. And I think that they should be a little bit honest about it, but I could be wrong. I was wondering what the TWIV team (coughs) thought about a price of $475,000. It's it's crazy. So that's uh, that's an insane price. I mean, that's probably four years of a professor's income. (laughs) Yeah. Well, you know, I agree. I I agree that they need to – Basically, they need to cover their they need to cover their costs and make a little bit of profit. They're yeah, sure. entitled to a little bit of profit, and I don't know what that calculation is. This is a a, a little complicated um, because it's uh, a, a one shot deal. You get this therapy once, mm-hmm. uh, and it's in a limited uh, number of uh, children. I mean, if you talk about thirty one hundred children in the U.S., uh, that's you know, that's, that's actually not a huge number. So I don't know. Some economist has got to, uh, run the numbers. It's fine. Uh, but I'm sure, and, but they didn't yeah. put it in that sense. They said, no. oh, it just reflects the value to the patient. What, well, what is this? Just be honest. You know, I don't get it. And besides, this is a technique that's probably going to be more, um, applicable to many other situations mm. besides sure. this. So this is almost like doing a, a, a dry run for a larger issue that you're going to settle. Sure. And that's how do you treat bloodborne uh, leukemias of all kinds? And I'm sure that there are other kinds like uh, a chronic lymphocytic leukemia, which is affecting many, many, many more people than acute lymphocytic leukemia. Yeah. And the same approach may be valid there too. So they'll have all of this work done. And basically, the the patients are guinea pigs for uh, for the future. There are many more similar trials, and they should be process. they should be paying the kids for taking part in these trials. What do you think, Kathy? I think yes, it's a lot of money, but I think like any of these new technologies, the prices will come down. You know, just think what think what a TI calculator costs. You know, when they first came yeah, out and, true. you know, no, you're absolutely right. and, and now you get it free when you open a bank account or, you know, yeah, that kind right. of thing. Right. And so, uh, you know, I agree. I think the companies that are doing the development should be able to make a small profit on this. And there just needs to be transparency all around. I think mm-hmm. there was there were those issues. I can't remember how long ago it was earlier this year. 
um, uh, that one company that was making ridiculous amounts, they would get some, buy somebody else's drug and then yeah. increase yeah. the price ridiculously. Yeah, he, he, went to, he was sent to jail. It was the EpiPen. Yeah. It was at the EpiPen. Right, yeah. EpiPen yeah. right for, for example. Was, and so, you know, that doesn't help everybody's attitude about, mm. quote, big pharma. Right. But, you know, for the most part, I I think that, you know, they're, they do have a bottom line, but they still want to do the right thing. And so I, yeah, it's expensive, but I, I think it'll change. And I think it's an important and exciting research. So the, so the EpiPen story, that the development costs had been paid. Uh, well, that was a, they, yeah, but they, I mean, that they was said the market will bear this 600 bucks a pop, so we'll charge it. I mean, that seems un- unlikely. That was the guy was sent to jail. I don't said. know how much the price will come down on this, you know, because it's a complicated procedure. So maybe the virus itself will come down in price, but you still have to go in a hospital. You have to have nurses and doctors and the hospital room to pay for, right? So it's not like yeah, this is a big this is a big deal. And yeah. it takes, you know, Do you remember? the actual yeah, engineering it, of the T cells is a big. Remember deal. LASIK surgery for for uh, mm. site uh, correction? Yeah, they now have a, a in in and out in the same day. You think of dental implants. In the beginning, they were very, very, very expensive. Today, they can do them in a day. There's a whole bunch of streamlining that can occur as a result of this. So stem cell, uh, bone marrow transplants have not come down in price, <laughs> no. right? No. <laughs> so no, certain haven't. things. So I agree with everything. I just want these people to be transparent in their interviews and say, mm-hmm. we have to recover the cost, and it'll probably come down in the future. Eventually, they will. All right. Yeah, I bet. That's I have the, a- uh, but otherwise, it's a really interesting therapy, right? Very it's so nasty. cool, and and I loved reading it. And yeah, I'm it's, it's started a long time ago, and it's great use of, of our yep. technology. Yep. Love it. Yep. Yeah, it's amazing. I have I have a couple of comments. Um, first of all, as uh, who wrote Peter uh, may be interested to know. I mean, we've said that uh, they use a lentivirus. Uh, it is, in fact, specifically a repurposed HIV. Um, which I think is fascinating. Yep. Um, but um, uh, <laughs> it's uh, cells, right? significantly repurposed. They've. Uh, it, it's amazing the kind of stuff that they have done. This thing doesn't even have any uh, transcriptional promoters in its long terminal repeat, which uh, create problems when can create problems when uh, when it integrates. Uh, it's uh, basically completely inactivated. So at this point, all it is is a vehicle for uh, delivering the gene and getting it uh, getting it integrated. Um, the two other interesting things. One is that a, uh, I think more than common. I think the side effect. I think basically everybody gets this. Um, it's pretty serious, and that is a cytokine storm. Because you get yeah, uh, you get infused with these uh, T cells, and they start to do their work, and they release a whole bunch of uh, cytokines, and uh, for a short period of time, you can become very sick. But they anticipate this now, and they have ways of uh, uh, dealing with it. And you know, one perspective on it is that if you experience this, it tells you that the therapy is working. It's working that's right. Okay. Uh, the other thing that interests me is that normal B cells contain uh, CD19 or B19. Yeah, so yeah, this right, thing right. kills normal B cells as well. Right. Um, and uh, that apparently can create a problem. Mm-hmm. And I, I would look, I would have an eye on that for creating a problem way downstream. We'll see how that works out. But uh, where there has been a, and you know, I. I mean, I don't really understand this because it seems to me that if you're going to cure the cancer, you want to get rid of it completely. But if you're going to, if you have the capability of getting rid of all of the cancer cells, seems to me since B cells express this as well, you're going to get rid of all of them too, and that can't be good. So there's there's some subtleties here that I don't quite understand. But they acknowledge in this uh, FDA uh, document that. Um, uh, trashing normal B cells can be uh, a deleterious uh, side effect, and they treat some of the kids who suffer symptoms from that with uh, immunoglobulin. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. We'll see how that uh, pans out in the future. I want to say uh, something else. Two uh, potential long-term uh, problems uh, with using retroviruses for therapy is 
uh, potential recombination and reactivation of uh, retroviruses, and that has been a problem uh, in the past, but they've engineered the HIV to get around that. And the other is uh, integration in configurations that can cause cancers down the road. And usually that's a result of the vector's uh, hot transcriptional promoter firing some oncogene or something like that. And uh, they've tamed uh, the vector in that regard as well. So they've taken all these things into account. Can you believe this? I mean, the engineering of the vector, the engineering of the transgene itself, I mean, none of this stuff resembles (laughs) <laughs> yeah. what what it's all man-made can you believe this yeah, it's, it's great, incredible great the virus chop shop it's a great <laughs> yeah very good yeah very good that's really good what well, my question is b cells originate from stem cells right which presumably don't have b19 so they will live and they have the genetic defect that leads to the cancer right. so I was gonna say that. you don't really cure the cancer. I don't know how this works, but the T cells do they stay around forever? So any new B cells that arise are killed. Is that how it works? I th- th- that's kind of what I was thinking is that this is maybe not a hundred percent, but it keeps stuff in check. Yeah, probably right. Uh, I, I I I don't know because it's not like removing a solid tumor where that's it. That's right. Here the the stem cells keep giving because there's a genetic defect underlying this, right? Well, maybe there are listeners out there who uh, know something about this and can write in and sort us out. I'm sure there are. We just have a bunch of great listeners out there. We do. All right. Uh, next next issue. So then we, we for our main paper, we have a, a polio paper. And in looking at that, I came across this short article, which I just wanted to mention, which is entitled Response to a wild polio virus type 2 shedding event following accidental exposure to wild polio 2, the Netherlands, April 2017. It's a rapid communication and Euro surveillance comes from um, the uh, National Institute of Public Health and the Environment in Biltoven, in the Netherlands, and also the Municipal Public Health Service in Le- Lelystad. Lelystad. Anyway, the authors, Dweezer, Rouges, Van der Weyden, and Timmen. <laughs> <laughs> and it's really interesting because type 2 polio had, was declared eradicated mm-hmm. in 2015. And there are many places globally where we still use wild type 2 polio to make an activated polio vaccine. So there are two kinds of polio vaccines, right, that we still use. An activated polio vaccine, Salk vaccine, which is produced from fully virulent wild type strains in production factories. And then we have Sabin vaccine, which is an infectious orally administered, which is made from Sabin attenuated strains. And so here uh, they were, they're manufacturing this in a Dutch vaccine manufacturing plant. And they say uh, there was a partly aerosolized high titer spill of wild poliovirus type two during vaccine manufacturing. And it frustrates me that they don't give any detail on that. I, I really <laughs> want to know what happened. They're still collecting the data, Richard. <laughs> partly. So what is partly aerosolized? Uh, it sounds to me like s- s- some a, a liquid uh, hit a surface and splashed. Yeah, maybe. How about that? Maybe that was it. Maybe lots of liters, and so there would be a big splash, maybe. <laughs> well, the, the the bottom line is that no matter what you're doing, you're going to have accidents, right? So mm-hmm. this is going to happen. And, and you have to know how to deal with it. Well, so this paper is all about how they dealt with it and how, you know, they said this is what was we did wrong and this is what we should do. Yes, Dixon. I'm curious as to the kind of building this kind of work takes place in. And is it a P2, P3? It's not a P4, I know that. But um, what is the nature of the manufacturing plant where this is um, done? Um, um, what is the uh, barrier? That's a good question. You know, to prevent it says stuff here, from uh, you know, they process the samples in two, and then when they were shown to have polio, they moved it to a three, but. I don't know if the production is actually in a three or not. Right. Because if type two is eradicated, it should be three or 3.5. That's right. the idea, but I don't know if that's actually what's happened yet. Hmm. So I don't know the answer. It increases that. because of the eradication, mm-hmm. the stringency of yes, biosafety. Yes, I know, but we don't know if they were 
doing it under three or not because right. they don't say. Or what the and emergency why, measures would be once you do have an accident, then what what's next? Lysol? Uh, you well, know, there's a whole uh, procedure. Yeah, exactly. Right? Clorox. I mean, I don't know what I would think about doing, but... Uh, well, Poor bleach is one way to do it, but you have yeah. to you have to minimize exposure to new people. I mean, first of all, everybody's vaccinated who's working in this place, right? right? So that is the first level. Sure. But if they're vaccinated with Salk vaccine, they can still get infected in the gut and shed, and that's the concern that they go home and shed. Are they wearing it. respirators? Do they work under hoods? Uh, well, that I don't know. I would assume so. I would assume you know. so, right? Yeah, I don't know. I don't now, know. if they're immunized with Sabin, they're not going to be yeah. infected in the gut. But with, with SOC, they will be. So here, um, two operators, mm. they were fully vaccinated, but they monitored them, right? Um, for, for some time, they took throat swabs and stool specimens. And one of these operators was polio positive by RT-PCR not too long after exposure. Mm. Exposure, what is it, uh, day three, seven, and Day four, day four after exposure, one of them was positive, and then they put that into cell culture, and it was positive as well. And so they followed uh, that one individual. They followed them both, but the one individual continued to shed for quite a while. Um, and they let that individual go home, and initially that they let him use the toilet, but then they realized that they shouldn't, so they had him use some self-contained device that uh, they say was inspired by Ebola procedures and then they would take all this fecal the matter and incinerate it immediately um so they say something's very interesting here this individual resides in an area of the netherlands <laughs> with high vaccination coverage which does not belong to the so-called bible belt an area where some inhabitants object to vaccination on religious grounds oh, and has dear. lower coverage so there, there are these there are these pockets everywhere right and that's the concern that someone will go home from a plant and bring polio Anyway, this person never developed poliomyelitis, but he did shed uh, polio for some time, uh, 30 days or so, something like that. So this is a person who was immunized and still became infected or was not immunized As and I became said, infected? Dixon, senti. Repeat. Senti me. Repeat, please. If you're immunized with Salk vaccine, your gut can still be infected. So he pos he must have swallowed some on the aerosol, All Right. right? So and they should immunize against both of these things. And it's definitely <laughs> replicating in his gut because it's excreted in the feces. They sequenced right. it. It's polio type 2. There's no doubt about it. His family was living with him, and they, they weren't infected. But the, his virus got into the sewage. Naturally. Because they went and looked in the, in the sewage, and they found it there. Oh, so, right. And it lasts there quite a while. It amazed me that they could actually find it in the sewage and for that long. Yeah. <laughs> so he must have been – he must have had – a fairly high titer. Or maybe there's another source so, that they don't know May, about that put it there. So May 3rd, a month after the accident, there's, they found I mean, they get, the sewage. Amsterdam gets a lot of, and Beethoven too, a lot of that area in there gets a lot of transients mm -hmm. from all over the world. What's the relevance of that? Uh, well, maybe somebody brought it in and maybe that's where it's coming from rather than just this one individual. It seems unlikely. But, I, but they're characterizing it by the specific sequence, which is in this vaccine okay, production okay. strain. No, this is, this is the vaccine that infected okay. him. There's no doubt. That's a good point. Right. Albert Sabin used to say that all the time. <laughs> you know, he, when he was still alive when we started finding vaccine-associated polio, and we would sequence it and say, look, it's the vaccine strain. He said, no, 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 those are wild strains that are infecting. He didn't understand that we could tell it wasn't a wild strain. But, of course, he didn't want his vaccine to be. Uh, exactly, this either. Exactly. So two things so far. Um, one is that the way this is written, they don't differentiate between IPV and OPV with respect to protection against disease without protection against infection. And so uh, that was just not well written, I think. But they are very careful. I don't think they ever mention the gender of the individual. And so it could be that it's a woman. Mm -hmm. I, I know it's easy for us to say he, 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 but um, it might be that it was a woman operator in this case. Just pointing that out. No, I thought sure. I thought I had clues that it wasn't. I don't think so. Oh, and then I had one other comment that I found it interesting that they call an area in the Netherlands the Bible Belt. <laughs> I thought yeah. that was a <laughs> unique thing to the United States. So. It might be the buckle of the Bible Belt. It's a very small country. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, I guess every country has a bunch of people that just don't uh, want to comply for whatever reason. Hello. Alan. Hey. Hello, Alan. Welcome to the club. Sorry I'm late. No, no, it's okay. Oh. We are just talking about uh, the Type 2 accident. Okay. Did you get any hint of the gender of this individual? I didn't. Um, I'm checking now for pronouns, searching the PDF, <laughs> and I'm not at, finding it. I was wondering, the part where they talked about the family, I thought it was nope. not nope. there. Huh? Nope. Nope. So I guess they don't want to identify this, make it easy to identify this person exactly. in the factory, right? Yeah. Exactly. Right. Well, for persons who had been in the house, yeah. And they, yeah. you know, they don't tell you exactly where the factory was either. No. Yeah. Right. And... Uh, and the fact that they don't tell the gender, I think, plays into a comment that I'll have when we talk about the excretion samples that they collect. So, hmm. Okay. But we can move on. Yeah, they talk about how they, they, they thought about putting this person in a hospital, but then you would worry about infecting other people. Like other people. Who are, who are there yes, as well. Yes, you would. Um, so anyway, in the, in the end, they had pretty stringent containment at home, which is not ideal, but it worked. Uh, this person was not allowed to leave home. So I think it was voluntary confinement at home, they said, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, limited amount of excretion in the environment, and then uh, nobody else got infected as far as they know. Um, and so they say, you know, this is, none of this was made, so there's a, uh, there's so they were in home isolation for 32 days. 32 days. Which so, would suck. So, um, well, if you have... I mean, I, I don't like to leave the house a lot anyway, but I, yeah, 32 <laughs> days would be a lot. That would... I suppose, yeah. Now, when a strain is eradicated, you go into what's called Global Action Plan 3. This is a WHO thing. Gap 3. <laughs> gap 1, Gap 2, now we're in Gap 3. It's a strategy to minimize polio facility-associated risk after eradication. And they say in this paper that gap three doesn't really tell you what to do in case of incidents like this. So they had to improvise. And they said it would have been nice. They don't provide guidance on how to, for example, prevent reintroduction of polio into the environment. Right. So they said this is what we did, but we would like to have further guidance. And maybe it's even country specific as well. So we need to mind the gap. Ooh, mind the oh. gap. Yeah. Anyway, what did you want to say? Because I'm not going to talk about excretion anymore, Kathy. Well, first of all, I was a little bit frustrated that it took so long through the paper to figure out what they did with respect to the, they call this person the infected operator. So before, you know, before they started talking about what kind of samples they collected and that the fact that they disinfected with chlorine after every defecation, um, do we know for a fact, 100% sure, that there's no polio excretion in urine? Hmm. I've never seen it mentioned in anything I've ever read. Yeah. So, well, anyway, so I, I just, and so just to jump ahead for the people who haven't read this, eventually uh, they used a, sort of a disposable toilet system. Mm -hmm. uh, they couldn't use a chemical toilet because that wouldn't, uh, inactivate the polio virus, right. but they found a disposable system as used for Ebola virus disease patients and easily applicable at the home of the infected operator. But they didn't use that from the beginning, as right. we already discussed, and that's why they found some in the sewage downstream. And it, it just seemed like you know some of that information somehow could have been presented earlier on. It, I just was kind of going crazy, like how soon are they going to start making this person yeah, you know yeah. collect all of the what comes out of them and right. they you know, they didn't ever make them collect all of what came out of them only the fecal matter apparently and, and also is chlorine a good choice for yeah chlorine's good and, that's what we okay. use yeah it's approved oh we used to use westcodine in the in the traps westcodine is okay we now use switch over to chlorine okay i mean and i buy it on the way in because fisher charges way too much for it oh yeah you don't you don't a buy a household thing from fisher 35 dollars a gallon and i can get it for four dollars oh. Yeah, in a spill-proof bottle at sh at shop. Yes, you know. <laughs> but um, yeah, Kathy, I don't know. You're right. 
So, for example, if you have to urinate, is that okay to go in the toilet or... But they do mention they disconnected the toilet from the sewage, so maybe that's eventually, to yeah, to discourage right. them from using it. But I wonder if they say if you have to urinate, is it okay to just urinate in the toilet, or maybe if it's yeah. turned off, everything would go into this bucket. I don't know. But as far as I know, it's, it's this not must in have your... gone over really well with the other people in the household. <clears throat> oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Mom, did you have to do did this? You have or to Dad, this? we have to well, do this. Really? <laughs> imagine this is the person that prepares the meals, and now they can't. <laughs> Are we having so, oatmeal again for I mean, dinner? <laughs> here's, here's the bottom line. This is why in a post-eradication world, making infectious vaccines is tough. Right? Yes. Because there are always going to be accidents, right? Yeah. And th this is great because they were totally up front. They didn't hide it. But you can imagine countries that would hide it, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, or even, this com even companies. <laughs> doesn't have to be a countrywide. But right. Yeah. So Is this person now virus-free? Um, according to the chart, yeah, there is no as far more. As we know, no more as detection as by know. culture or PCR. They say it's more sensitive to put the samples in cell culture, yeah, than PCR. Okay. By the way, I'm happy to point out that they use L20 B cells to detect virus, as well as another cell line. But L20 B were made right here in my lab by Kathy Mendelson. Oh, yeah, hot dog. Right. She took L cells and she had produced a plasmid encoding poliovirus receptor uh, and that was called l20 she had l20 a uh, 20a and 20b plasmids and she put 20b into l cells and made a cell line and um how darn phil minor who used to be at the uh, fda equivalent uh, in the uk said let, let me try those cells for <laughs> the good thing about them is that they only are infected with polio so none of the other enteroviruses will infect them Right, and so it's a nice selective isolation diagnostic tool. So I'm I'm very proud of that. Maybe that's the yes. one contribution to, to polio I've made. Oh, I think you it's made a, a it's a little, it, you're too modest. I, I made Alan Dove. That's the other contribution. Oh yeah, there, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a uh, this uh, gap three document is 173 pages long. It's a little shocking <laughs> that you can't get out of that what to do. I mean because. Yeah, this is what this is about, right? Totally. And that's and minimi this is, this minimized totally polio virus facility. Is, excuse yeah. me? And this is a totally anticipated event. Yeah. I mean, you, you had to see this coming. This is, a, this is a typical WHO document. It's really long and is it, it ends up leaving stuff out. <laughs> Pretty stupid. Hard to paste on a wall and just step one, step two, step three, step five. Right. <laughs> you know, in case of fire, do not go down. <laughs> But I, as I said, I discovered this while looking at the main paper that I want to tell you about, and it, um, the main paper is relevant to this, and very much yes. so, because it suggests how we could make polio vaccines without having to grow infectious virus. Right. But before we talk about that, I'd like to tell you uh, a word from the sponsor of this episode. Can I, can I just comment yes, one other thing about this paper that really struck me mm -hmm. um, when I looked at it and I, I started to read the you know the spill and everything, and I thought, wow, the world has changed so much. I mean, you spilled some some P two on the floor, and this is <laughs> like this major incident. Yeah, and you and I used to spill I, P2, right? Oh, gosh, you know, get, get a paper towel. And forget about it. <laughs> oh, boy. Things have changed so much. Yeah. Right. yeah. Yes. I mean, okay. Oh, oh that's of that's what happens yeah. when you're, you're trying to eradicate a virus and get to a point where you would then stop vaccinating people. You, you got all kinds of biocontainment issues that you wouldn't have had before. Mm -hmm. but here we are. Mm -hmm. Which is good, right? Yes. Now the, good problem to have, yeah. Good problem to have. The difference is, of course, with smallpox, the vaccine doesn't look anything like smallpox right. virus, so you don't have to worry about manufacturing it. Right. Right. But polio is polio virus. Yep. The Defense Threat Reduction Agency is a sponsor of this episode. And imagine an everyday inexpensive drone you could buy online, modified by terrorists to spread chemical or biological weapons over a crowded football stadium or holiday parade. Plague VX, sarin, weaponized flu. How could we prevent this from happening? How could we treat the victims? How could we counteract the effects? Join us in Long Beach, California, November 28th through 30th for the 2017 Chemical and Biological Defense Science and Technology Conference to exchange info 
on the latest and most dynamic developments for countering chemical and biological weapons of mass destruction. Collaborate with over 1,500 scientists, subject matter experts, military service members, industry partners, and academic leaders from across the globe who are committed to making the world safer by confronting chem biodefense challenges. Part of the U.S. Department of Defense and charged with safeguarding our warfighters and our nation, the Defense Threat Reduction Agency's Chemical and Biological Technologies Department hosts this important conference and brings together the best and brightest from around the world. Please join us to share your important ideas. For information and to register, you can go to cbdstconference.com, and you can also follow the conference on Facebook or Twitter. On Facebook, just search for D-O-D-D-T-R-A, one word or one acronym, D-O-D-D-T-R-A. And on Twitter, it's CBDST Conference. The 2017 CBDST Conference, today's innovation, tomorrow's warfighter capabilities. Uh, Bob wrote in a while ago, spotted while browsing news sites. And he sent a link to a BBC article, Plants Hijacked to Make Polio Vaccine. And of course, we went immediately to the literature, as Mark Chrislip would say. <laughs> and this is an article ba- as published in Nature Communications, Plant Made Polio Type 3 Stabilized VLPs, a Candidate Synthetic Polio Vaccine. And on this paper... First author, Johanna Martian, Helen Fox, Mohammed Bahar, Abi Kocheka, Elizabeth Fry, David Stewart, Andrew McCadam, David Rollins, and George Lomons- Lomonosov. Now here, the idea is to make an empty capsid polio vaccine, no nucleic acid. And this, we've been, we can make empty capsids for years. You just have to do two things. You take the precursor, of the capsid coding region, polioviruses are icosahedral naked capsids made up of four proteins, VP1 through 4. So you take a precursor to VP1 through 4. It's sitting right here on the desk in front of me. Dixon has it in his hand. He even knew that. And it's not empty. That one is not empty. No, this is not empty. It's not just a model. Otherwise, we'd be in trouble with WHO. That's right. This is true. And uh, you have a plasmid with five proteins, VP1 through 4, and then you have another plasmid encoding the protease 3C, which will chop up that precursor, and they will oh. fold and assemble into an empty capsid. Look at that. However, normally you do that. These empty capsids fall apart readily, and they are not immunogenic. They will not induce protective immunity. That's sad. So I, I wrote bummer, a holy bummer. grail. <laughs> something in, in, the, in the field that has been a goal is to try and figure out how to make empty capsids give rise to the right Stay. antibodies. Yeah. And that's something we talked about um, some time ago on TWIV, it was TWIV 425, actually still in the 400s, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And this was uh, a paper, w- the name of the episode, all the coronaviruses all the time. And this was a paper in which uh, Andrew McCadam and his colleagues had s- passaged, or mutated the capsid precursor and then identified mutations that stabilized it in the empty capsid configuration. So for the details on that, I refer you to TWIV 425. And you can pause this episode right now. You can go and listen to that <laughs> go one. listen to that one and then come back. <laughs> come back to this you one. will have spent four hours listening to us. So that, that altered capsid now could be used to produce stable antigenic capsids in a number of systems, including... I think it's worth, it's worth pointing out that these... That, that the bottom line on that is that these are pretty highly engineered. This is a Very. pretty sophisticated process to get these uh, stable. Which we talked to get about. These stable right? cats. Yeah, that. which we talked about in detail. I think there are eight amino acid changes in the end. Yeah, I think even mm-hmm. more. They talk. They mentioned that in this paper, but quite a few. Right. So here they say, let's produce these proteins in plants, in Nicotamia benthiamia. <laughs> Nicotiana benthiamia. Nicotiama. Nicotiana. Nicotiana? Yeah, that's it. Benthamiana. I should look at it while I'm trying to say it, right? It's that a tobacco would help. plant. I could say... Ag- tobacco. I, I, Nic- nicotine. I, tobacco. I could say agrobacter tumefacients pretty you could, easily. You could say that. That's pretty good. How you, a linoleum. Can you do linoleum? <laughs> How about chrysanthemum? <laughs> Nicotiana. 
benthamiana. Yeah. Uh, no, 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 no. hmm. yes. All right, tobacco. This is, this is not tobacco like they grow no, um, just just down in the Connecticut not Valley. The smoking uh, kind. You can't smoke it. This, no, this, this is, is not smoking. This, this is Australian. Um, it's a related species that grows all over Australia natively, and I don't think this. I don't think anybody smokes this. No, you know why they picked this? It's too bad because you could get your vaccines. It's right? extremely susceptible to Agrobacter. To I, I, I toured yeah, to put so genes it's become, in, a, right? major, yeah, right, exactly it's become right. a major. Yeah, exactly. Become a major plant fact, model people, because you can engineer it very easily. People working in these uh, plant factories to manufacture these vaccines are they screen out all the smokers. If you are right. a smoker, you can't even step in the building because your lungs exude tobacco mosaic virus, which could wipe out their entire crop. So that's very interesting okay, so stuff. The way you the put use, the use of Agrobacterium and Nicotiana uh, goes back to the eighties for sure. Absolutely, so. absolutely, yeah, yeah, no question, no question. In fact, I remember in grad school presenting a paper on it, and I thought it really? was really cool that you okay. needed this. Bacterium to get Our genes. Our worlds into plants. are coming How together, cool. Vincent. Our worlds are coming together. What worlds? Your world of virology <laughs> and mine of vertical farming. Oh, your, your vertical farming. It's world, gonna yeah. make a single unit someday. You know Dixon. I do know him very well, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I know him too well. Dixon, we did an yes, episode did. called "Vertical Vaccine Farm." Yeah, I know number forty-seven. That's way back when. And we talked about making a back in the flu, day. producing flu HA hemagglutinin in yeah, plants. Yeah, that's what they were using. It and of course, now that's in clinical trials. Yep. And uh, well, you know that was a great idea, and that people was a jumped DARPA on it. Sponsored. All right, so here they they put these two plasmids, a, a plasmid encoding VP one through four, which is the P one region, yep. and either wild type polio type three or this mutant selected in the previous TWIV episode. <laughs> Jim's playing around skt sc8 a, a name that will last forever which is the just one that it, make, just call it skate skate that's right skate and it makes nice stable empty capsules so they put them in uh, this tobacco like plant and uh, they they do so by putting the plasmids in agrobacterium and then those are put into the plants and and Rich, you you researched extensively how this happened. Yeah, because I was because I was interested in in their expression system. So as you say, it's uh, Agrobacterium tumorphaceans, which which uh, has a habit of uh, injecting a plasmid called a TI plasmid into plants, which can then the genes on that plasmid can be expressed in the plants. Um, actually, a little aside here: Why does agrobacterium tumor faces do that it does ordinarily in the wild it causes tumors in plants um is uh is is that it's a normal gig <laughs> you know cause uh cause proliferation of plant tissue to make a home for itself or something like that could happen at any rate uh it does that uh there's you can have a stable or a transient expression system in the long run what you'd probably like to do is grow plants that contained this and stably expressed it, right. but that takes yeah. a lot of that takes a lot of fiddling around. Uh, and in order to test whether this is working, they use a transient system, where they take leaves and infect the leaves. And there are several different mechanisms for doing that. The uh, method that they describe, they say pressure inoculation. Uh, so, uh, set exactly what the, let me call, get it, this. They call it infiltration. Uh, press, yes. Pressure infiltration and give a reference that's behind a paywall. But I looked around and convinced myself that what they're using is, uh, that's a fancy word for just having a solution of the bacteria, uh, in a syringe, uh, that does not have a needle on it and pressing the blunt end of that syringe against the backside of the leaf and uh, uh, pushing the plunger so that under pressure, it uh, moves some of that fluid uh, into the leaf, and it winds up in the interstitial uh, spaces, and then ultimately the bacteria from that space transforms the leaves. And you can, uh, part of the re way I was able to convince myself of that is if you look at the leaves, uh, you can see where they've done the infiltration. They've got spots on them, okay? I like so that they, uh, they drew in pan or marker on some of these leaves with, yeah. <laughs> and they labeled them A, B, C, D. 
It's great. So it's a it's a it's a transient expression system, and they talk about their their yields. I would imagine I would imagine making a you know, as they point out when they had what was it when they had the three CD protease expressed at a high level, it uh, caused necrosis in the leaves. It really trashed the leaves. So they had to change the promoter on that to back off on the expression of the pro- protease so it wouldn't kill the leaves. I would imagine that when it comes to making a plant that stably expresses this, you're going to have more problems. Okay? Yeah, yeah. You, you got to make a plant that's going to grow and all that kind of stuff. Um, and you're you're walking a fine line between expressing enough protein that you can economically purify it and not express it, and not killing the plant. Right. So, so the uh, when I visited Caliber Biotherapeutics uh, down in uh, College Station, Texas, uh, they had a different system for infecting their plants with the same bacteria. They would put them in a small vacuum chamber, each plant, and they would have an assembly line uh, of this. And uh, in a partial vacuum, they would then introduce the agrobacter with the plasmid inside, and the stomata of the leaves would actually be as wide as they could possibly be. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Then when they sprayed the plants, then they – Release the vacuum back to normal pressure, and the stomata closed up and uh, kept the neat. bacteria oh. inside. They could do one like every ten seconds. Oh, that's a right. pr- that's a production thing. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And and those plants cool. are permanently infected. Neat. They only wanted to grow for three weeks. So, because um, then they I could looked extract into this too that. when I saw Rich's figures, and uh, when I tracked down the paper behind the paywall. And then also talked to Dave Rollins, one of the co-authors on the paper. Uh He said that the preliminary studies mostly were done by the simple pressure inoculation using the syringe, hence the leaves with the uh, spots on them. Um, They have facilities for vacuum-induced infiltration, and that's the paper that's behind the paywall. And that's Mm. the method that's uh, been around for a long time. But before I found the information behind the paywall, I looked up other methods for introducing agrobacterium. And there's something called uh, the floral dip method, which has Mm. a huge number of citations where you don't have to dig the plants out, do the vacuum infiltration, repot them. Uh, You simply dip dip the floral tissues into sucrose plus a surfactant. And so that seems to be a way it, that paper came out in 1998 versus the vacuum fil- infiltration, which is from 93. And um, so uh, I wrote to Dave to say, well, uh, you know, here's this floral dip method and, you know, maybe that's going to be faster and easier uh, for this kind of thing in the long run. I don't know. So basically you don't need to make transgenic plants. Right. No. That's what it sounds like. No. Okay. You can do all this uh, by transiently. Exactly. Okay. My, my other question would be, is, is there an insect or an arthropod vector that could be used to introduce the agrobacter? I mean, does that occur in nature, for instance? Hmm. I don't know. Don't know. I don't, know I either, don't remember ever hearing anything. A lot of leafhoppers that. and insects that inject stuff into plants. Uh, yeah. To get their share of this of the sap could be possible. No, no, no. I like dipping in sucrose. I do too, actually. But then you have to wash it afterwards. Well, that's not a problem. With the vacuum method, there's no fuss, no muss. It just moves right on. I don't know that you have to wash afterwards. We'd have to look at the protocol. Mm. Anyway, they were able to make particles. When you use the wild type sequences, you get bad-looking particles by EM. They're all broken, yes. <clears throat> which is consistent with what we know, that these fall apart readily. And they're skate mutant, nice particles, and they they have a yield number, but I don't know what it means, 0. 0.06 milligram per gram of fresh tissue, but since they're not extensively inoculating the leaf, right, that's not as much as it could be. Yeah, Can that, I that, yeah doesn't mean a lot. <clears throat> assume, because I, I'm not as savant as you are, Vincent, of yes, course. Yes, you are. You're no, no, not really. Savant. I'm, I'm interested to know whether or not the antigenic site is not a single protein, then. It's a combination yeah, it's of proteins? Yeah, it's a combination. Yeah, okay, yeah, so right. that's why if it falls apart, you don't get Exactly. Them. Okay, fine. Exactly. I just wanted the listeners out there that don't have a background in virology like myself. Yeah, the empties have long known. They, they fall apart, things. and uh, right. they're not... They're, they're not the right answer yeah, because otherwise we'd be just expressing that protein right and forget sure. about the capsid then well sure yeah and in fact someone wrote this week why don't we just express v- or produce vp1 so how many viruses just as an another aside then. Uh, don't don't ask how many <laughs> no no how many do you know of <laughs> in which the antigenic site is shared by the proteins rather than just on one protein many uh, many 
Isn't that unusual? It's not unique to Picornis. No, no, I understand that. Well, why? No, it's not unusual. I mean, some viruses are made of one polypeptide, right? right? In which case, you can produce yeah. one polypeptide, but wow. still, you should, uh, you know, you probably need to assemble it into a capsid to have the proper antigenicity, right? Another good example is the papillomavirus vaccine. Ah. Which that assembles, uses, yeah. That uses virus-like particles, and, and the individual protein. proteins won't do it. I see. I see. You, you make, but when you produce a single protein, it assembles into a virus-like particle. Got it. Mm-hmm. Right? Got it. So these assemble into virus-like particles. The skate are stable. Um, they purify them. They actually solve the structure of both. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> pictures, lovely pictures. Um, <laughs> that's another thing that's changed. Exactly. They do this very quickly. <laughs> Cryo-electron <laughs> microscopy can uh, allow you to have structures very quickly because you don't have to make crystals. Right? You just have to image the particles, and they can see... Uh, you know, what the changes, these eight or plus uh, amino acid changes are doing to the structures. And um, the the most important part of this, of course, is to uh, immunize animals with them. Yes. And they do that in transgenic mice carrying the human receptor for poliovirus. They immunize them uh, with one or two doses of their Voila. virus-like particles, or they, or they also they use actually virus or virus-like particles, and uh, they show that uh, one or two doses protects against challenge with wild-type poliovirus type three, mm-hmm. at least in these mice. Mm-hmm. So um, they are immunogenically appropriate, and they give give rise to good antibody responses and protective. So that's pretty neat. <laughs> Very neat. So the point, and the the real key here, I think, is that they're going to have to tweak, and maybe they'll end up using insect cells or yeast or something else. Who knows? But you don't have to have infectious poliovirus around to make vaccines. Now, here's the issue, and we've talked about this before, but let's remind everyone. We cannot test these new vaccines because there's no more polio. There's not enough polio (laughs) to test it, right? In fact, as of this week... To date, 2017, there have been 10 global cases of wild polio. Really? And 47 cases of vaccine-derived <laughs> wild polio, which is caused by the Sabin vaccine circulating and hitting unimmunized people. So, And those are in Afghanistan and Pakistan only, the wild polio cases. The circulating vaccine-derived cases have been in uh, the Democratic Republic of the Congo and 39 cases in Syria, which of course has been has not vaccinated well because of issues there, so um, we need to get away from these infectious vaccines. But we can't test new ones, right? Because there's right. no polio. Now, mm-hmm. some countries have already approved. I think China and Japan the, the production of um, IPV from the Sabin strains. Mm-hmm. Okay, so then if you had a spill in a manufacturing plant. <laughs> You'd have less concern about people. You'd just be vaccinating uh, them. You'd be vaccinating <clears throat> them, right? Yeah. yeah. But the U.S. so far has not decided that they will approve this without a trial, but, but we can't do a trial, right? And and the problem is, I mean, it, it adds a little bit of safety because you'd be you'd be exposing people to the Sabin virus, which is safe right. uh, rather than the wild type. But if you have a shedding problem, like we talked about in the first paper, then they're going to shed virulent virus because that's what happens when somebody gets right. Sabin vaccine. Yep. So you're not it's gonna not perfect. really you're not really going to get around the problem. It's it's better, but it's not the perfect solution. The perfect solution would be to do something like this virus virus like particle, but as you point out, you can't do a conventional test. So I think what's probably going to have to happen with this if this even gets pursued. I mean, I kind of take the cynical view that basically the world's going to turn off the lights and forget about polio once the mm. um, the wild circulation is done and we're just going to wait a few years until there's another outbreak. Um, but if we take this seriously, as we should, <laughs> then um, this should go to a something like a phase one clinical trial, obviously for safety, and then you look at the antibody response you get. Mm-hmm. In volunteers right. in that trial, and hopefully you'd be getting an antibody response that's similar or identical yeah. to the one that you would get from the vaccine, and then you'd say, "Well, it's probably going to work." Well, the I, thing is, you could use this in a post-eradication outbreak, right? Yes, right. 
And so uh, I did write to Dave Rollins, my friend, who's one of the co-authors on this, and he pointed out that that's uh, essentially what this is for. And uh, this work is funded by the WHO in a consortium, and Dave is the PI, but it also includes Andy McAdam and uh, others co-authors on this paper and the previous paper that was in the previous TWIV that we talked about. Um, and and as Vincent alluded to, um, they are looking at other methods of expression, yeast, baculoviruses, and so forth, but so far the plant system uh, got there first. And they are working on doing this for all three polio serotypes, and they're close with types one and two, but they need more optimization. Um, but very specifically, uh, eradication vaccination to prevent the catastrophic reemergence of polio from whatever source in a naive generation of infants. Right. Mm -hmm. so I'd like to add something to this story, too, because I think it's important to realize that when you grow viruses in, let's say, chick or duck eggs and then try to extract the virus later on during the production phase – uh, you often end up with products from the embryo of that egg as well as the virus itself so that you get immunization against products that might eventually give a bad reaction for no other reason than you've got look-alike antigens in your own tissues. Whereas with plants, you extract this thing like you would grapes and making wine. You put it in a plant press <laughs> and out it comes because yeah, yeah. it accumulates in the uh, – in the extracellular space rather than in the cytoplasmic space. And so it's a three-step procedure basically to get a purified virus from this kind of, or an antigen, I should say, because mm -hmm. they insulin, they use this to make insulin as well. So uh, this has huge advantages over those things. They, they, um, as I said, the flu HA when produced in plants makes virus like particles. Yeah. You only need the HA gene, nothing else. So there's no toxicity from a protease. Right. And that's in phase one, maybe beyond. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that was that's made in the plant in Texas that you that's correct looked at right. That's are there correct. other plants that are making plant vaccines around? Plants the that are there are two other places in the United States. One is in Delaware, and the other the, the third one is in North Carolina that also use the same technology to make other products of interest. Mm -hmm. So you know, there's a West Nile plant yeah. derived vaccine also. Yeah, yeah. so. Um, they also, in the, the old days, the, the developmental one, not, at, not at Texas A and M, they actually thought about engineering bananas to produce hepatitis B surface antigen right. <laughs> to make an edible vaccine. Yeah. Yep. Right, mm -hmm. and that that didn't go over too well with a lot of people, I think. Well, potatoes have been proposed too. Uh huh. Right now, the banana. See, not everyone likes bananas. That's a problem, right? Yeah, but. They were going to purify it from the banana? No, they were going to leave no. it in the yeah, banana. That was, just eat the banana and get vaccinated. I remember Hillary Kaprowski, many years ago <laughs> when he was alive, he called me and he said, Vince, what do you think about making vaccines in bananas? I really want to do this. Yeah, edible. Edible actually. vaccine. So instead of using tobacco, you could use lettuce. Right. Right? Or something else like that. You have lots of options here. I think the plant approach is great. I do too. I looks, really like it. It looks very it's efficient. easy to do. Easy. It's really simple. And... Uh, Maybe one day all their vaccines will be made, or many Maybe. of them will be made in Maybe. plants. That would be cool. It would be. Would it be in the next 10 years? It's possible. Mm -hmm. Economically speaking, this is much cheaper than doing it the other way. Much cheaper. And certainly less food. I think the less, number with uh, the flu HA in, in uh, tobacco, one square meter of oh, plants right, right, gives right, you right, 10 right, or 20,000 right. doses of vaccine. Yeah, exactly. Incredibly cheap. Exactly right. Uh, the production level is incredibly uh, more efficient than in eggs. All right. Let's do a few emails. We have w a couple actually from Anthony. The first one, he um, he sent a letter to the author. So no, now Anthony is not only emailing us, but he's emailing authors of papers. We have <laughs> um, gotten him brave enough in his knowledge to be able to. Author, which is great. It's fact checking. <laughs> uh, so he had a quote here from uh, Ryan Harrigan, um, who was an infectious disease biologist at UCLA and one of the authors of uh, a study. It's like after a flu outbreak, everyone builds up immunity and the impact tends to wane. Eleven, and this is talking about West Nile and birds. Right. So Anthony wrote him 
and said, has it been determined that there are breeding populations of infection survivors that now have immunity, or might it be as in fennels, feral rabbits, that there is a combination of selection Fenner. of reason? What did I say? Fennel. <laughs> it's an Italian... Um, you're yeah, you're still in the vegetable aisle. <laughs> I know what fennel... Yeah, yeah. It's funny. It's really sorry, funny. sorry. I think I was rushing into feral. <laughs> That's why right. I did fennel. You combined, you made a hybridoma out of that word. Or there's a combination of selection of resistant individuals in tandem with reduction in virus virulence, perhaps just for some species. Anthony, great question, and certainly not mutually exclusive ideas. The curious thing about West Nile as compared to flu, however, is that the strains don't tend to evolve nearly as fast, so the virulence year to year shouldn't change much, if at all. I know some birds have recently been tested that were healthy but still ended positive on ELISA tests, but whether this re represents increased immunity or just recent infection is hard to determine. The bad years for West Nile weren't due to some new strain hitting the population, which is different than the flu outbreaks that occur. It may be that those outbreaks represent a new crop of immunologically naive birds hitting the population. And along with, with Anthony's email were links to two papers, one in Science News West Nile virus still wiping out birds across North America. That was from 2015. And uh, persistent impacts of West Nile on North American bird populations from PNAS. Um, and Dixon, um, are they still, is it still wiping out birds in the North, North I, America? I think it probably is, but I, I do unofficial surveys every time I take Route 80 or Route 17 to go fishing. <laughs> and I see lots of crows now where I didn't see them for quite a while after the outbreak started. You mean flying, so, not dead ones, right? Yeah, well, that's right. Feeding along the roadside, mostly in, in these uh, drainage ditches. Uh -huh. um, so I, it's it's anecdotal. I, I, I don't have a good handle on um, bird populations, but I know that once a year, I think it's around Christmas, all of the ornithologist uh, empathizers and sympathizers go out with their little notebooks and their binoculars and pencils, and they do a bird survey. Mm. And it's called the Christmas Bird Survey. And right. I'm not sure whether or not uh, crows, I, I think they should be counted in this too. So you could probably go back and check to see. Probably it depends on where the epidemic started and where it now is sort of a sporadic epidemic, okay? Because in the Northeast, unless there's – some ridiculous drought. Uh, it's still a, it's still a, uh, an, uh, a, zo a zoonotic infection. And I think the birds are being constantly exposed. And I think right. that perhaps the corbidae at least have been doing better nowadays mm -hmm. than they had before. So, and I see a lot of blue can jays. You, uh, can you make so that? While, while you're driving down the highway doing this, are you <laughs> listening to counting crows? <laughs> I just saw them no, last I, week. I, by the I have way, a concert. book on tape called "Murder: The Murder of Crows." Murder of Crows. <laughs> I saw Counting Crows last week in concert. Did you? Know? Oh, really? yeah. They were not very good. They weren't very. Mm. No, that's too bad. Um, I think their their albums sound better than they did in person. Well, Dixon, can you make a crow sound? Ah, ah. Can you take oh, the next? Quite good. Can you take the next email? <laughs> uh, wait, 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 wait a minute! I got an answer to the question that was going on here. Oh, okay. This, in this science article, science, uh, what is it? Science news article that summarizes the, the paper. Um, it uh, uh, details some of the die offs, which are really remarkable. Some of these species, yeah, yeah. the original infection just got wiped out. That's true. Um, and uh, some of those have bottomed out. Some of them are uh, coming back significantly, mm. uh, but some of them are still uh, dying off. Uh, at a regular rate, yeah. uh, like uh, we're talking about uh, a, an eight to nine percent decline year after year, still going on. So it depends a lot on the species. Some species weren't hit at all. Some species were wiped out. Some species were not wiped out as bad, but uh, continue to uh, suffer from this. So it's a dynamic process. Yeah. All the this species specific apparently. The introduced birds from uh, from Europe are doing great over here like starlings and sparrows so and pigeons too. So they were never hit by this epidemic. So I'm I'm curious as to whether or not the ecologists are paying attention when you lose a whole cohort of bird species that perform some ecological function did other bird species step in to take up the slack and mm. to continue that effort to like insect control for instance and things like that so, so the fact that the european birds are have been doing okay does that reflect uh, a selection in a west nile positive environment initially in europe or something like that that is correct that is absolutely okay. correct dixon can you take the next ashley writes afternoon doctors 
Long-term listener from the outback of South Australia, about six hours' drive from the state capital, Adelaide. Can you read it in an Australian accent? I can't. I, no, I dare not do this. Brine? If I was auditioning for the job of the gecko, I might force myself, but I don't think I could do it. <laughs> <clears throat> I happen to hear your comments on several Australian issues, and it's battle against introduced pests. Australia has had a habit of not thinking about the long-term impacts of introducing exotic animals, with several destroying the habitat and causing the extinction of many native animals and plants. Two of the worst, I, sh I think she meant worst, rabbits on the land and carp in its waterways. Two viruses have been used against the rabbits with a fair success, but the battle continues. The herpes virus against the carp has not yet been released, and there is still no plan as to how to deal with an estimated 5 million tons of dead fish expected <laughs> from that epidemic. <laughs> Some say it may be more. Well, I think you should put a bounty on the fish now, and they'll be all gone in a week. Uh, reports are thought are no reports are though that they are aiming for release at the end of 2017 it would be an interesting show for your listeners on the use of viruses in Australia and its fight against introduced pests well worth investigating well, we have <laughs> <laughs> exactly yeah, we have several times <laughs> kind kind uh, king kind i think she meant king or current kind rather kind. she writes king king that's it's funny the, the reflection um, i wonder where she heard it maybe a news program picked up our comments possible and she doesn't know that we've talked about it on. Possible. I didn't realize they had such a carp outbreak either. Oh, well, she says. I know we do. We have lots of. Yeah. Oh, this, this is a, this is amazing. Or horrible. Uh, and there's a. Uh, uh, we got another email coming up that we can go into in more detail because there's an article <laughs> linked in it that's really good. Rich, right. can you take the next one? Oh. You don't want to. Okay. No, I do. <laughs> that's that's cool. I just gotta just gotta reorient myself. Um. Mark writes, dear team, firstly, thank you, Kathy. Do you know why he's thanking you, Kathy? No, I, I have don't. no idea. We're about to find out. <laughs> I, well, I oh. don't think so. Oh, no? Oh, I know why. Oh, why? Good. This was the fellow who wanted to write Parliament about. Oh. Uh, and I think you explained something, right? Right. Okay. okay. <laughs> uh, secondly, the following paragraph of my last correspondence should have been less ambiguous. Quote, just a thought on the naming of myxoma virus. I'm not sure if it was a mucus or perhaps pus, end quote. Um, <laughs> he says, please note the question mark at the end of the paragraph, inferring my doubt. Uh, so, okay. The substance was coming from the noses of rabbits and substances from the mouths and eyes as well. I wasn't really asking you to make a diagnosis on the show. I was just <laughs> conveying my observations. Uh, most of the uglier lesions were around the openings of the rabbit's body, mouth, nose, eyes, anus, etc., uh, and did in fact have a clear and white substances exuding from the lesions and or orifices from memory. I, in my naively, in my naivete, thought uh, the observations were implied in thinking that someone on the team might have seen a rabbit with mixo. Uh, I know now that obviously wasn't music e mucus, even though there was a clear viscous substance involved. So, I mean, this is all about, you know, whether or not there was mucus in these lesions. It's not a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> Lastly, I had been excited to think that I may have been championing you guys in your comments on TWIF 457 made it sound to me that you thought the experiment to be somewhat sloppy slipshod. Uh, in the fact that no useful answers were gained because they had not used rabbits that may have had the requisite mutations, i.e. wild rabbits. You also sounded to me to be disappointed in other aspects of the research in the paper. Um, so this is what got him worked up and wanted to write a letter to Parliament. As I said in my initial correspondence, I usually don't take positions, take up causes, or take sides, especially in things I know nothing about, hence all the question marks in the phrase I have written to ask your advice in regard to anything much nowadays. Just thought I might be a useful pawn to gather some useful answers on your behalf. I really don't give uh, uh, much uh, about <laughs> what kills us all in the yes. end. I uh, 
Just find that you and all of your voice is comforting, knowledgeable, and interesting as I go to sleep in an evening. <laughs> Please don't interpret this as a poison pen letter. I'm just telling it how it is. I obviously misread your concerns in regard to the paper. No malice is intended in my clarification, this letter. I simply wanted to set the record straight so you don't think me completely stupid. I listen to both Twip and uh, Twiv and Twim and enjoy them both very much. Thanks for all the work you put into it. I really do appreciate it. Sincerely and with warm regards, Mark. Hey, Mark, chill, dude. No problem. No problem. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> no, right. problem. no question about it. You no, know, this is just, uh, we're just doing science here. That's right. So we, I, uh, we make observations, we ask questions, we look for the truth. Okay. Sometimes we're right, sometimes we're wrong. Yeah. It's cool. Everything's cool. So if you see something coming from a rabbit's nose and you're wondering whether it's mucus, well, it's not. <sighs> oh. Uh, Boo. Um, I took the, the whole thing about him describing that what he had seen looking like mucus or pus or something to be a possible explanation for the etymology of myxoma. And that's all mm -hmm. I took that for. So. Yeah. And I thought it was plausible that it was named original, originally because of that. Remember with the numbers as large as we're dealing with, when you've got carp or rabbits in the millions there are bound to be some resistance out there <laughs> that's all you're going to do is replace all those dead ones with the live ones that will go and replicate again so, so um mark we just you know if you if you tell us something we're going to talk about it that's you all Absolutely. if you say you thought you saw mucus we're going to go well is that mucus or sometimes ad nauseum that's what we do so don't worry <laughs> no, about it's it it's what we do yeah. Yeah. this is what we do yeah and, that's right. and thanks for writing and thanks for listening yeah, it's we, all we, good. Yeah, yeah. keep listening it's all good come on we, keep listening yeah. All right, uh, Alan, can you take the next one? Sure. Anthony, right? This is Anthony from above, right? Yeah, yes. same man. Okay. Same guy. Uh, on a different topic, uh, links to a story on um, the carp problem in Australia. And this is CC to Ken McCall. Right. Um, who's who's working on that, using, using herpes virus to eradicate feral fish. Mm. Here, you outline the use of cyprinid herpes virus 3 to control carp. If the virus is used, are there plans to mirror Dr. Fenner's research with rabbits? It will be extremely interesting to see if the virus indeed does evolve to, to accommodate carp. Dr. Lipkin is studying a virus that appears to affect only tilapia. Is there any possibility of using this virus to control invasive tilapia in Australia? And I just learned something new. I didn't know they also had a tilapia problem yeah, in Australia. No, I, no, I didn't. Um, is there any species that is not a problem <laughs> in Australia? Well, uh, somewhere back in my distant memory, I was uh, on my sabbatical leave in Melbourne, and someone published a book on the Australian trout. Now, trout are introduced into Australia, of course, mm -hmm. but they had been there for up to 100 years prior to that, so they now considered it a native fish. Okay. And so maybe that's the definition of what is and is not introduced. Well, I mean, everything's invasive at some point. Yeah, though, yeah, you're right, Alan. It's absolutely correct. And so, okay. so Ken, Ken replies, um, hi, Anthony. The answer is yes to both your questions. <laughs> We're planning to stud a study in collaboration with Professor Edward Holmes on the evolution of the host virus relationship for CYHV3 and CARP with full genome sequencing of both host and virus. We're also exploring the possibility of tilapia lake virus as a biocontrol agent for tilapia in Australia. Cool. Yeah. Well, it looks like we have to have Anthony on staff here. Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> exactly. Yes. He's, he's so, doing a lot uh, of so follow-up. He is. Oh, we've got another. Shall I take the next yeah, one? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Okay. So Anthony writes... Again. Reed Fenner makes a mitosis paper. <laughs> Luck favors the prepared mind. While searching for Fenner's papers online, someone gave me a box of old books, perhaps from a cleaned-out basement. It was the... Yeah, in it was the Harvey Lectures. Yep. If it wasn't for your shows, I'd have thought it was just a dusty copy of stale material and tossed it. I'd not have recognized a collection of reports of fundamental research by towering figures. Cool. We have contributed to the recycling. We have. Of old yes. books. With good ideas. Kathy. <laughs> so wait, wait a minute. In the former letter, uh, Anthony uh, uh -huh. uh, links to an article on the carp issue in yeah. australia that's yeah. actually quite good we ought to put it in the in the show notes it the, and these fish were originally introduced in 1859 so that's uh okay. like 200 years ago that's back that's back with the rabbits right those are native fish <laughs> and now comprise up to 90 percent of the fish biomass in parts of the murray darling basin that's incredible 
Hmm. Uh, so this is serious stuff. Sure. And he's got, if you read this article and read the end, there's comments. And some of the comments are, it's about time. Get rid of these things, right? Uh, well, <laughs> you should find a use for it and then put a price on it and it'll disappear in five seconds. Well, the problem is carp's not very good to eat. Yeah, but they can be used for other things like uh, fertilizer, value-added yeah. products. <laughs> so back in TWIV 388, you make carpet. No, May, May 2016, <laughs> we talked about using a virus, this virus, to kill off the carp. The, the title of that episode was What Could Possibly Go Wrong? Exactly. Right. And we linked to an article that t- in the conversation, which was called Carpageddon. Just <laughs> <laughs> cool. Hey, well, we can add this one too because I didn't see this last time. This is from January 2016. <laughs> mm. Very good. Um, did you read his next one? Yes, you uh, did. I did. Okay, the, yes. Kathy, please. Dakota writes Dear Twiv team, this is mostly meant to be a thank you letter, so I hope that it doesn't become too self indulgent. After graduating from high school, I still wasn't sure what kind of career I wanted to pursue. Instead of jumping straight into college without a goal in mind, I ended up traveling around the country and participating in environmental activism. Things were great. I had a lot of fun, but eventually I realized that I should be thinking a bit more about my future. In 2014, two important life events happened. Ebola ravaged across West Africa, and I spent a week in a West Virginia hospital with what the doctors tentatively diagnosed as Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. This ignited in me a passion to better understand infectious disease. It was while waiting under observation before they decided whether or not to discharge me that I discovered your podcast. Although I couldn't fully understand most of what was being discussed, I was immediately interested. After a few more episodes, I felt pretty certain that I would like to study virology. Once I was discharged with a prescription of antibiotics and the good news of no permanent negative health effects, I bought a plane ticket back to my hometown, and enrolled in classes at my local community college. I'm now at Western Michigan University, finishing up my undergraduate degree. Last year, I worked in the microbiology teaching lab, mostly preparing growth media and pouring plates for students to conduct their experiments. A few weeks ago, I was hired into Karim Asani's virology lab, and there's few times I've been been as excited. His research was discussed on episode 124. I'm currently reading through one of his most recent publications, and uh, Dakota gives a link, and reading through this in preparation to assist in researching the oncolytic properties of Tanapax virus. The difference between what I'm doing now and what I was doing three years ago is pretty striking. (laughs) I set out with a pretty specific goal, and I feel like I've accomplished quite a bit toward that in a relatively short period of time. I can't wait to see what else happens in the near future. Your podcasts are owed some credit of that for that. Science communication continues to be an important vehicle for the betterment of society as a whole and of individual lives. Keep it up. Thank you again, Dakota. Awesome. Awesome. Nice. Cool. Yeah. That paper from TWIV 124, Viruses That Make You Better. Uh-huh. Uh, we had Grant McFadden as a <laughs> guest and he had a so Kareem Asani uh, was the next to the last author on a paper with Grant interaction of human TNF and beta two microglobulin with Tanapox virus encoded TNF inhibitor. Cool. Did you know? Small Kar- world. Did you know of Kareem? Course, of, yeah, of course I know Kareem. Small world. This is great. So uh, Dakota, say hi to Kareem for me. <laughs> Shout out to Kareem. This is great. Nice. <laughs> All right, let's move on to some picks. Okay, okay. Alan, what do you have for us? I have um, something that I was just deeply, I was up to my elbows in for a little while. Um, <laughs> this is a, a, a new setup that I've used to renovate my personal blog and my Turbid Plaque site, and I've started blogging again. Um, yeah, like I, getting a new pencil when you have to write a grant. You know? Exactly, <laughs> right. No, I actually, this worked. Um, a couple of years ago, I switched to a static uh, site. Mm. Um, generator and I thought it was going to be a big improvement and it actually added just enough friction to my blogging process that I pretty much stopped. Mm-hmm. Um, so that didn't work out and I finally recently I said okay what's going on here and I looked back at my post history and I said okay that happened exactly when I switched systems I'm going to go back to something else. 
Um, WordPress, I find, has gotten just way too bloated and difficult to deal with. And so I started looking around and found this thing called Grav, which stores the files for the site as flat files. Um, so no, there's no database. Everything's just done as text files. And then it loads from the text files and puts together what I think is a fairly good looking site. And they have a bunch of themes for it. It's actively developed and it's open source. So it's a, it's a good alternative to WordPress if you're looking for one. Um, hmm. And that is, uh, that is my pick this week because I think it, it is actually working really well. So what's the advantage to having a flat file? A couple of advantages. Anything that, that targets um, like a MySQL exploit yeah. security-wise, I'm immune from that because I don't use the database at all. Right. Uh, so that's one thing. Another is that um, it's somewhat self-archiving. My posts are what are called markdown files. They're at a plain text file format. Mm -hmm. So there's no issue with having to export everything from a database and then import it into some other database in order to be able to access old posts. Um, I've got my posts written as markdown text, which mm. is, you know, text files are about as close as computers get to having an archival format. Yeah. So that could then be ported to some future site if I change um, platforms again, which who knows. Um, and it's just it's just easier to manage overall. And, and conceptually, I find it a lot more straightforward. Mm. So, Alan, will you need to... Uh take all your old posts and put them into this or you'll no, leave them um, as is? Or? I'm going to leave them as is. And one of the advantages of the static site generator is that it's self-archiving. And when I made that transition, I actually took everything from my blog, from the WordPress version, going all the way back to 2006, um, and ported it over to the static site generator. So that's now static HTML files sitting on the server, hmm. which basically they're they're that's about as archival as the web gets, right? So that's plain old HTML. They're never going to change the way they look, which will become dated after a while, but that's fine. If you're looking at old posts, they'll look like they're old posts. Mm -hmm. So they're just going to sit there. Mm -hmm. So Markdown was written by John Gruber. Did you know that? Yes. Whose blog I read on a daily basis. Daring Yeah, Mark, Markdown, Markdown is great. It's just plain text with a few little annotations you can put in to mm -hmm. include things like links. And then you can use stuff like Grav to turn it into, into prettier output. Uh, it's actually become the standard way that I, that I write now. I, I write in Markdown in plain text files. Neat. Yeah. A little geekiness. Yes, a little geekiness. Wake up, Dixon. I'm totally awake here. Get near the mic. I want to hear your pick. Please. Oh, I didn't know it was my turn. Okay, my pick is a, a reference back to the paper that we reviewed on the production of polio vaccine using naked capsids. And this is an industry called Caliper Biotherapeutics, and it's located in College Station, Texas. And it's um, a freestanding institution. It's not associated with the Texas Tech Group. Uh, but it was started with a startup fund that was garnered from DARPA. Okay, because they were producing uh, uh, influenza vaccine for the army, and that's what they were charged with. That was their first product. But I visited this facility. It's quite amazing. It's a nine-story equivalent they, building. They grow pot. No, that's trivial. <laughs> they, they they're charging a lot of bucks for what they grow here. They're they're making insulin in plants. They're making factor nine. They're making vaccines of various sorts, um, mostly. Um, uh, antivirals, but uh, I don't know if they're going to make any molecular vaccines. Like their website them. is all about pot. Yeah, it's about pot. Um, making well, hemp oil. Yeah. Well, that's not pot. Well, they, yeah, got pictures, pot. they have pictures of pot. Well, um, weed. <laughs> Dixon, weed. In, in Texas? <laughs> I didn't think they had that legal there. <laughs> sorry to interrupt you. I'm sorry. No, it's okay, but uh, they weren't growing that while I was there. That's for sure. They were using that tobacco plant to grow all their products, so uh, if that's what they're doing now, I'll withdraw my pick of the week, and I'll come back later for something else. No, but, no, it says it's uh, Caliber Bio, right? That's what you're talking about. Caliber Biotherapeutics. You may Bio. have the wrong. Maybe you have the wrong. I, you know what? This might be a ripoff from their site, and this is you're absolutely. 
these people have an Ontario address. No, this is not the place. I've I, got a completely different. I've you know got, what? I yes, will. I will I've go got back. The correct. I've got the yeah. correct link. Correct. Thank, you, using, using, thank, totally you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Forget what we said about pot. I'll They're, be they, it's using over. tobacco to save lives. Yeah. Right. I'll cut out all the pot stuff. That's exactly right. So it's, this is horrible. Yeah, tobacco to save lives. Right. Okay. Yes. It's in Texas. Please substitute that. And what do they do, Dixon? Oh, well, they use plants to save lives. <laughs> and they, and they, this is where they produce the yeah, flu vaccine? that's correct. That's and you correct. saw them doing the vacuum process? Yeah, it was, I, was, I took a tour of the entire facility. Okay. I was very pleased to see. Where cool. I, and then they kicked us out because Genentech was coming in in an hour. <laughs> well, they have money They have money, and you they don't. They did have money. They, they, they wanted some products. They wanted monoclonal antibodies made mm. to various uh, tumor antigens. And so is Roche going to buy a Caliber? Good idea. Or farm or or uh, Pfizer, I, and I I have a friend who works at Pfizer, well, and I keep telling them about this, and I don't know why they don't do it. I, I'm just amazed. So this seems to be a subsidiary of a company that's based in Austin. Really wow. rich, is that right? Mm-hmm. Go for it, Rich. Mm-hmm. EEA Consulting Network. Engineers. Yep. Look at that. Hey, Rich, you want to come out of retirement? <laughs> sure. Why not? <laughs> hey, already. <laughs> I just uh, uh, you know I. I uh, I just want to be able to take off and go sure. mess around anytime sure. I want to. Dixon, you know about this. <laughs> I do. Right? I do. I do. I like, know a lot about sayonara. this. Sayonara. I don't want to. Like, that's, right, that's right. That's right. That's you right. Know? <laughs> no, but you can communicate from wherever you are. It doesn't matter, yeah, right? That's right. That's cool. Yeah, yeah I, I do you. enjoy that freedom. You're welcome. Oh, and yeah, there, uh, this e- looks great. And EEA is employee owned. Nice. That's even better. So that's all improved since I've been there. So that was about three years ago. So that's I'm glad to see they're revolving. And there are two other facilities like this throughout the country. One's in Delaware, one's in North Carolina. But it looks like EEA does all kinds of stuff. This is yes. one of their things, right? Yeah. Okay, good. Rich, what do you have? Uh, I have Google Street View of the International Space Station. <laughs> <laughs> this is cool. I, I, I just thought this was amusing. I got two links here. One is the uh, Street View of the station itself. Uh, and actually, if you, uh, it, 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 it is a subsection of a Google Street View site that has street views of lots of places, uh, but it includes the International <laughs> Space Station. And there are um, like 17 different uh, street views of different modules, okay, with a little description of what they were. And then I also link to an article that uh, uh, talks about how they made this, uh, that interviews some people at Google and uh, the astronaut who actually did the uh, filming. Uh, while they made this. The one thing they're missing on this that I would like uh, is a a picture of the space station itself. I mean, this ought to be set up so that there's a picture of the space station and you can click on the module and that will trigger the street view. Right. Uh, because, what, because what I, you know, I, you know, it's cool to look around at the modules, but I just kind of want to know where I am in one module relative to another module and how to get there. But um, so... If there's some yeah, because when you go, you don't want to get lost. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so, at any rate, it's pretty cool. There's a lot of well, wires sticking out all oh over my, the place. You know, there's stuff everywhere. Hey, look, they have cameras velcroed to the wall. A lot of yeah, there's, stuff. There's one module. There's one module that is just absolutely looks like their camera repository. That's lousy with cameras. <laughs> but how do they avoid like catching all these wires while they're floating around? Yeah, well, that's the other thing, know. isn't it? You got a laptop here. Eek. They have all these signs that say two cup. Is, it, is that the bathroom? Cupola. Cupola. <laughs> cupola. Oh, yeah. yeah. Everybody wants to go to the cupola, right? And cup. Try to find that cupola. in this mess. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah. Nice. Wow. Very nice. Thank you, Rich. Cool. Kathy, what do you have? Well, I picked the obvious <laughs> for today. <laughs> well, I'm um, glad I you said somebody had to do this. Great yes. obvious. I picked the Cassini photos. So the link is to a New York Times site that has, uh, I forget if it says how many, yeah, 100 images from Cassini's mission to Saturn. And then I looked at it the other day and they're absolutely beautiful. And then they are. Uh, it's been updated as of this morning. So they took the last images yesterday, but uh, Cassini before it crashed was still sending back data 
uh, but it wasn't photographic. Uh, so that was today. And um, then I found out one of my colleagues watched it live or live streaming. And uh, I said to him, well, uh, just looking at the still pictures and reading things about it, I had tears in my eyes. So I think if I had watched it live, the tears would have been <laughs> rolling down my cheeks. Yes. It's just, it's just, you know, the story about how it almost didn't get funded and sure. uh, all of that is just really cool. So it all started back, well, probably before, but um, 1997 and then um, was when it was launched and got to Saturn, I think, in 2004 and just a lot of really beautiful photos. So, yeah, so check amazing. it out. Do, they don't have anything as it comes in and crashes, right? No. <laughs> no, fast. because it's at 76,000 miles an hour. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's a little and, bit tough uh, to get a focus point on and, that. And I think the visibility was probably quite bad. <laughs> bad. Yeah. yeah. No, so they, they did the last images yesterday, and, I, and I, I read the reason behind that, and now um, I'm, I'm not able to find that. The, the last images yesterday – Something about because of bandwidth or something like that, because they were leaving the antenna up all the time. And then um, as it was going in, then the antenna tilted away and they lost the signal. So they're pretty sure of what happened was that, yes, indeed. It so crashed. was it was was it planned for it to crash or? Yes. yes yeah. Of course. Oh, yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, it this, was running, this was out, the of, plan. running it, out of gas. Okay. Right. This, this was the plan all along was that when it after it had gathered um, right. this vast trove of data orbiting Saturn, and then they would put it into a decaying orbit and crash into Saturn and collect data from the um, on the way down. Yep. Yeah, that's what it was. They were um, sampling the atmosphere all yeah. the way down, exactly. or as far yeah, down. Because as this this is a gas giant planet, so we don't even know how far down the the apparent surface goes. That's mm -hmm. all. That's mm -hmm. all right. gas. So there's no possibility of leaving it in orbit. It would it wouldn't be? They were afraid of it wouldn't damage. Be. They were afraid of crashing it into a moon. Basically, I see. that's what okay. they were afraid. Right, of. and it, and it, it had kind of run its course. And you know, you're going to leave it in orbit. What are you going to do next? Um, when you could instead, when's the next time we're going to get a spacecraft all the way out to Saturn, where exactly. so we could actually have a chance to um, send this thing in and Neat. and have it go down. So uh, this uh, there's this little video at the end of this uh, link, uh, Kathy. That's actually quite good. Uh, okay. I, I really enjoyed that. And um, it was, was it last night? Last night or the night before? They had a Nova on this, on PBS. Yep, I watched that too. On the Cassini message, which, which was very nice. Not only that, there was a lot of um, parody for women being involved in this project. I, unbelievable. I think that I think that more than 50% of That's the correct. people that they interviewed on that That's show right. were female. Yeah, and I, yeah. I actually got to talk with Carolyn Porco once, and she is a delightful person and articulate. You should see mm -hmm. her last post. She has a blog post that I'm, uh, I get updates from, and her last blog post, I'll share it with you. It's quite touching, actually. It's very well-written and uh, very poignant. She was, I can't, she was a I can't, pick of yours once. She was. You know. Yep. I, I, I can't believe <laughs> I can't believe how over the years they can tweak the orbit of this thing. Yeah, I, I yes. you Richard, know, I'm, I'm totally mm -hmm. make agree with go, you. <laughs> make it go through all the you know, exactly. sling it around Titan and then make it dive between the rings and the planet. Right. And I mean yeah. the the engineering is just just amazing. I have to tell yeah. you that there's a lot of room between the edge of the ring and the surface of the planet though. So you know that's it seems like a, a fantastic feat, but there's yeah, so like much room to play with. Yeah, there's like 120,000 miles or something. You know, like oh, that, they, you know what I couldn't believe? They, they described the rings of Saturn. And, the, you know, they're made out of pieces of ice, right? Right. And they're how many hundreds of thousands of miles wide? You know how thick they are? Mm. 30, yeah, 30, 30 feet. 30 feet. Cool. Yeah. 30 so you could put a bunch feet. of Earths between the ring you and the planet. Almost, right? when you see it in, in absolute flat on edge, yeah, it doesn't cool. look like it's there almost. But they weren't, the first time they decided to dive the spacecraft between the rings and the planet, <laughs> yeah, we're they sure weren't really sure that That's there right. was nothing right. there. Exactly right, exactly right. I, you know, these pictures with the sun, with the oh, sun behind. The some planet. remarkable, yeah, it just yeah. makes you... Uh, we're glad we're part of this solar system. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, um, Neil deGrasse Tyson uh, tweeted a picture that I'll send you guys that shows a, a picture of Earth uh, with Saturn. Yes. 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 Y
Well, I'll, I'll send you a picture. I'll tweet a picture of a virus. How's that? <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh. Speaking of which, Vincent, <laughs> yes, there's sir. a storm on the one of the poles. I think the North Pole oh, of the planet the hex- yeah. that is hexagonal. Uh, exactly hey, right. Really? Yeah. It's a yeah. big virus. Nice. But the other thing. How though, do you uh, get a hexagonal storm? What's that all about? Where do, is this among the photos here? Yeah, I it's believe a video. So. They have a video. Yeah, if you look even at the one at the very bottom, just before burning into yeah. Saturn, and you right. look at the top. Of the planet, you see the hexagon very clearly. The thing that's really interesting about that is that it changes color with the seasons. Uh-huh. So it isn't always the same color either. And that's so right. that's mystery after mystery after mystery. It's fabulous. And how many moons? 60 62. something. It's okay. an amazing. Where's, I mean, this, it's where's, where's this hexagonal? I don't see it. Okay, so, so start start panning down from the top, like uh, the fourth scroll, scroll picture. All the way down. Like, I'm all the way the, down at the bottom. I see a move right okay. above the video. You see burning into Saturn right above that. There's a picture of Saturn. Right. And if you look closely, there's a shadow at the top, um, that of uh, at the North Pole that is hexagonal. Yes. It's big. It's very big. <laughs> I, not, oh, okay, got it. Yes, very it's f- the dark. Got areas. it. Got it. Yeah, that's cool. It's huge. A virus on Saturn, yeah, it makes there you sense. Go. On Saturn. Okay, <laughs> cool. That's pretty neat, yeah. yeah. All right, uh, my pick is a podcast called The Bioinformatics Chat. Hmm. It's on episode 10. It is produced by Roman Chepliaka, who is from Odessa. And he sent me this a couple of weeks ago. Uh, he's a Ukrainian software developer and bioinformatics enthusiast. Now, this is not um, for everybody. <laughs> this is really hardcore bio com- computational biology. Oh, Dixon is showing me the hexagon. Very good. The video. Where did you video. find that? It's just type out Saturn and go to Google Images. All right. All right. <laughs> And, and this podcast, you can kind of guess from the episode titles that it's pretty hardcore. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They just released Spatially Variable Genes and Spatial IDE with Valentine Svensson. Yeah. Mm. So if you're into <laughs> computational biology, I, I've listened to a few and I like them. He, he usually interviews someone who wrote a paper on some aspect and um, a lot of it goes over my head. But I do appreciate learning a little bit each time. So you can check it out. And I wrote to him and I said... Um, you know, Kunin doesn't like bioinformatics. He prefers computational biology. Eugene Kunin, right, Rich? <laughs> yeah. So he said, wow, I didn't know that. I guess this makes sense. As a biologist, he's doing computational biology. And coming from a programming background, oh, I am no. interested in bioinformatics. I'd love someday to be able to call myself a comp- computational biologist, though. Mm. So that's pretty cool. Oh, anyway. so there's a hierarchy. Okay. <laughs> So, uh, check it out. It, you know, it's, <clears throat> if you're really, if you're interested in, in this, if you do it for sure, you should listen. Um, and I, I like it very much and I, I think it's great. He said we inspired him to do this. So I think that's great. I think imitation is wonderful. So good luck great. with that and give him a little bump. That'll do it for TWIV 459. You can find it at Apple Podcast, microbe.tv slash TWIV. Questions and comments, send them to twiv at microbe.tv. And financial assistance is greatly appreciated. Microbe.tv slash contribute. Dixon de Pommier is at thelivingriver.org, depommierphotoart.com, and parasiteswithoutborders.com. And those are only three of many. You should consider going to a flat file format. I probably should. Talk to your webmaster about it. I will have to do that. Thank you, Dixon. <laughs> You're welcome. Alan Dove is at alandove.com. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. You can also find Alan on Twitter as, this is going to be really difficult, <laughs> Alan Dove. Yes. Kathy Spindler. And, and you can find me at Turbid Plaque. TurbidPlaque.com, which is now a flat file format. Flat file format blog. And it's but a you static. Won't notice that it, by reading it. It's not static, is it? No, it's not static. It generates the pages dynamically, mm-hmm. but it's it's sort of halfway <laughs> between uh, the, the bloat of WordPress and the minimalism of, uh, of a static generator. Right. D- Dixon, your De Palmier photo art site is a static site. Which can I, I tell you? you? What can I tell you? <laughs> Kathy Spindler is at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks. This is a lot of fun.
Rich Condit is an emeritus professor, University of Florida, Gainesville, currently in Austin, Texas. Thank Yeehaw. You, Rich. <laughs> sure enough, always a good time. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I want to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV. And I want to thank the sponsor of this episode, the Defense Threat Reduction Agency. The introductory music on TWIV is by Ronald Jenkins. You can find his work at ronaldjenkins.org. Com. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. Ah, ah.